What an honor to be here. Distinguished faculty, honored guests, treasured family and friends, of course, President Stirk. I am uh, tremendously honored to be here. This is an auspicious time. And I gotta say, I'm frankly a bit humbled to be here as well. Uh, Professor Stirk has been at Emory for 20 years and has ascended to the presidency. I've been here just a couple of years less and I'm just the morning's entertainment today. <laughs> but there are many uh, reasons to celebrate and there are many reasons that I jumped at the opportunity to be here as well. You're the first female president of Emory. First female president. Kind of has a nice ring to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, For those of you that were hoping to hear those words two and a half weeks ago, you get to hear them today instead. A lot has happened since then. But I really did jump at uh, the opportunity to be a part of this amazing collective history of Emory. And truth is, um, I have uh, three outrageously curious and engaged daughters uh, and a wife who spend their time uh, trying to change the world, trying to make it a better place. There's a lot of girl power in my house. And uh, oftentimes when I'm thinking about giving a speech, I'll bounce it off of them and they have no interest. They all wanted to contribute to this one in some way. <laughs> My eldest daughter, Sage, is 11 years old and she simply said um, that President Stirk inspires her and that every day she's more convinced that she can do whatever she wants to do and be whoever she wants to be. So as a dad, President Stirk, I, I wanna thank you. I've been trying to do this for years as a dad <laughs> and you did it just by being who you are. I grew up in a household where my mom was also a first. She was the first woman hired as an engineer for the U.S. auto industry. She was an immigrant from the other side of the world uh, who dared to dream big. Tough to do. It was pretty powerful, uh, but it's had an impact on me until this day. Um, how I behave, how I approach the world, how I see the world, and that, that we have this genuine belief that anything is possible by anyone. My middle daughter, her name is Sky. she's nine years old. She was obviously very inspired as well, but also wanted to get down to some specifics. What does a woman president wear day to day, she wanted to know. <laughs> how much jewelry? Um, and of course, how are you planning on decorating your new home, the Lullwater Estate? She also suggested that all your direct reports from here on forth refer to you as Madam President. <laughs> I agree with that. My youngest daughter, uh, her name is Soleil, she's seven years old, and I think she provided the greatest insight of all, and this is why. Um, she didn't really understand why I was asking her for her input on this particular topic. What difference does it make that she's a female? And with all due respect, Madam President, she thinks there's nothing special, there should be nothing special about women wielding power. It's uh, true enlightenment, right? <laughs> You know, um, my wife agreed with all of this as well. Um, her instruction to me, though, was maybe I should tell a joke or something at this point because she thought I had overdone it with the whole gender thing. So I asked her if she had any guidance, and she said, be self-deprecating. Which I always think is interesting advice, be self-deprecating. Um, I said, well, what, can you be more specific? And she said, well, tell a joke about neurosurgeons. And I said, well, there are no jokes about neurosurgeons. <laughs> So she said, I'll find you one. <laughs> so just bear with me for a second. There's a guy who's in the hospital. He's, he's very ill. <laughs> the um, doctor comes out to talk to the family and says, look, your, your loved one is very ill. Um, we think the only thing that's probably going to help is a, is a brain transplant. The family's understandably confused. A brain transplant? I, I didn't know they were, they were doing those. Oh, yeah, we started doing brain transplants a few years ago. Started at Emory University by Dr. Dan Barrow. And um, the bad news is that they're very expensive and insurance doesn't cover them. They say, well, you know, how, how much is it? And they say, well, it's $500,000 for a male brain <laughs> and uh, $250,000 for a female brain. All the men in the family nodded as if this was the most obvious thing they'd ever heard. <laughs> and finally, one young woman spoke up and she said, well, hang on a second, Doc. How come it's so much cheaper for a female brain? And without missing a beat, the doctor replies, well, that's easy. They're discounted for having been previously used. So, yeah. 
My, my wife says she wants a joke about neurosurgeons, but then has a joke about all men instead, apparently. <laughs> um, I thought long and hard about a couple, a couple things I wanted to say today, and I think more than anything, President Stirk, you know, I've been here for some time, and I believe Emory has the ability to make a better and stronger world, and it also has a responsibility to make a better and stronger world. And as I've traveled all over the globe, I'm constantly reminded of this. Um, you've cited as a goal to reach out more deeply to the Atlanta community, to better cultivate this town-gown relationship. And I applaud that and would like to do whatever I can to help as well. I would include as part of that message that the Emory community is special, uh, that this is a national research university which brings discoveries and hopes and pragmatic solutions to people all over the world and right here at home. So our goal is nothing short of making people healthier, better informed, and stronger, and pairing that with the responsibility that Emory has to create, preserve, teach, and apply knowledge for the greater good. But there's something else as well. I think something that's harder to define, a trait, a DNA trait that seems baked in to so many of the people here at Emory. Um, this is not a population that is content to sit on the sidelines. They not only want to fully engage with people all over the globe, they want to jump in and lead. And I've seen this. It often happens even as the world is crashing down all around us. And there are examples. Uh, Associate Dean for Leadership uh, Development, Ken Keen, is someone, I don't know if he's here, but he's someone the Emory community knows well. Uh, but many may not know that Lieutenant General Keen was also the commander of Joint Task Force Haiti. And in that role, he was ca called to lead the largest US military-based operation for a foreign disaster in our history. It's an amazing thing, 22,000 personnel, 19 ships, 57 aircrafts, $500 million. That's what he was charged with to try and make the world a better place for those citizens of Haiti. And hundreds of thousands of people benefited from that. And I got the chance to see it firsthand. And Keen is a brother in our Emory family, bringing not only his skills, but his experiences and his sensibility. And we are all better because of it. Over the last decade and a half, I've covered every war, every natural disaster, every pandemic in the world, but never did I imagine that some of these stories would be right here in our own backyard. And that's what happened two and a half years ago here at Emory, the Ebola. It's part of our history now, but keep in mind that a patient with an Ebola infection had never been treated in the Western Hemisphere. It had never happened. And candidly, most Americans were understandably a little frightened at the prospect. While Ebola is not terribly contagious, it is highly infectious, meaning even a small amount of fluid could cause an infection. There were so many concerns and fears, and for many, as tough as it was to admit, it was a disease better left somewhere else, anywhere but here. And yet, when two relief workers got sick with Ebola in Liberia, Dr. Bruce Ribner and the Emory community did not hesitate. Under crushing public attention and scrutiny, Emory set out to do something that had never been done before. I got a chance to do Dr. Ribner's first interview. I had to take advantage of my status as a faculty member here. And he told me something that really stuck with me to this day. He said, the reason we are bringing these patients back to our facility is because we feel they deserve the highest level of care. Simple and powerful, audacious and achievable. He's saying this, not only will we open our doors to you, we will help you. We will take care of you. It's a message that Emory sent around the globe that day and a message that still makes us all very, very proud. These are examples of Emory making the world a better place and also making us better at home. I also believe that, you know, President Stirk, you're becoming president at such an important and pivotal time in the history of our country and the history of our world. There are real collisions between science and conjecture. At times, uh, a true disdain, seemingly, for evidence and facts, even an assault on truth and knowledge. I see it. I live it. Higher education, I believe, is crucial, more crucial than ever, and higher education needs leaders willing to fight on its behalf. We must be careful to not let higher education, long considered the great equalizer of opportunity, be pursued in a way that steepens those inequalities. Even more on point, I think, is this growing and worrisome belief that even as desperately as we seek it, college really isn't worth it. That no matter how wonderful, rich, and robust the experience, that college only exists for one reason, to get a good job. It's a perception of higher education that has to be addressed 
and has to be corrected. It's not a trivial challenge. And yet, from what I know of President Sterk, I'm confident she is just the right person to take it on. There's going to be needed changes in ingrained institutional habits. People are going to constantly need to speak up about the values of Emory and remind people about the real dangers if a place like Emory fails to exist. You hold the title now, signifying that you're in charge, but your real authority is going to come about in how you embody that mission, how you express the passion, and how you give expression to the best energies of all these faculty members here and all this in the body of Emory uh, University because people live their lives in pursuit of higher education. They dedicate their lives to this, and now you have an opportunity to pave the road for them. I have great faith in you. I really do. You were the first in your family to go to university, and you became president. It's incredible. It's an awesome thing. You're willing to take on the most difficult challenges. I, I also want to welcome um, Professor Kirk Ellefson. I believe he's here somewhere. Your best friend, your husband, and your research collaborator. I thought this was interesting. You're also an expert on southern plant species. Now, as a northerner, I don't know much about this. I only really know about kudzu, the invasive plant species all over the south. And I found it really telling that President Sterk, who married someone with such an interest in southern plant species, likes to pull weeds in her spare time. That's what she does for relaxation. I, kn I knew she'd like to take on these big challenges. Or, or an example of her, her speed on the football field. You may not know this story. But it turns out that uh, President Sterk was playing defense in an intramural game between the presidents and the provosts. Um, Earl Lewis was explaining to her the concept of defense, which is understandably challenging concept for the Dutch to really fully grasp. <laughs> n nevertheless, um, she missed the defensive opportunity, and Earl was explaining zone defenses. And even though her eyes were glazing over, something must have stuck, because on the very next play, our new president, who runs like a gazelle, I am told, intercepted a pass and then proceeded to run like the wind in exactly the wrong direction. <laughs> with Earl in hot pursuit begging her to reverse course. <laughs> we know we're on the right course now. And, and Madam President, many may not know that you lived in the Netherlands up until age 30, and as an immigrant, to this country, you've already contributed so much. I think it's a point worth making, especially right now. <laughs> thought, I, um, thought I would end with another quote from Martin Luther King, like my colleague, and this one is uh, one that maybe President Sturk has been thinking about a lot as well. Uh, one of my favorite MLK quotes, which basically says, we may have, may have all come on, on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. I'm happy to be in that boat with all of you. Congratulations to President Sterk. I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you.